extrasensory perception and the chordate nucleus. Bernard Heisch wrote in The God Theory that the brain may be a filter rather than an enlightener. It filters the entire wealth of information and restricts it down to simply sense perception. This could then lead us to assume an individual identity similar to the alt described by Bernardo Castrop. The people that are able to get a wider sense of reality might therefore be those with greater access to the informational realm and could be those with the additional fibre connections in their chordate nucleus. The same people that Aldous Huxley called visionaries all of the time in Doors of Perception. These additional connections could be a brain deficit or indeed an evolutionary stage increase. Their perceptions are widening beyond the normal bodily senses and starting to perceive a more complex reality and the information contained in things beyond their usual observed physical attributes. I'd previously made a video on a presentation performed by Dr. Gary Nolan and Dr. Christopher Kit Green at the Consortium for Space Genetics at Harvard Medical School that described the additional brain connections. Dr. Nolan also pointed me in the direction of a book titled Through the Curtain by Viola petit Neal, PhD, and Shafika Karagula, MD. This book describes how Dr. Neal would go into trances and receive night classes where she'd have anomalous visions and obtain information that there's no objective reason for her to receive, especially if those details were accurate, which hindsight appears to confirm. Dr. Neal had a night class on December the 10th, 1961, where she had received information about the chordate nucleus, stating that millions of antennae in the future would allow people to see events at a distance, which is reminiscent of the CIA's remote viewing program. Also for telepathic contact and allowing people to read the planetary records. It's an incredible piece of literature, and we can only assume that Neil herself would have had these additional chordate pertainment connections that Green and Nolan are studying. The book states, The chordate nucleus deals with the head antenna, millions of antenna which in the future will deal with the ability of all the extrasensory perception abilities, such as the ability to see events at a distance and the ability of telepathic contact. The sending and receiving station for telepathic contact is located in the chordate nucleus. The nucleus is the mechanism that would be activated as, and used as the race develops. Some people have a certain amount of development. The ability to read the planetary records, Akashic, has something to do with a certain antenna activated in a chordate nucleus. This is the physical mechanism used by the interplay of the top of the head centre and the Kundalini centre, base of the spine or root centre, with its outer focus in the Ajna centre. This would be the physical mechanism for handling this ability from the etheric to the physical. This physical mechanism is the chordate nucleus. The ventricles in the brain act as a screen, like a screen for moving pictures. Shafika Karagula could you describe the chordate nucleus as you saw it in thought form presented in class? Viola Petit Neal. This thought form was about three feet long and about two to three feet deep, depending on which part of it it was. The teacher projected it in midair, but did not discuss it completely because there were lots of things that were interesting in that large projection. There were innumerable lines like the radiations of the sun. There were different sensors for higher sense perception. There were very fine lines, thousands of them, and a chordate nucleus is like a miniature brain for higher stages of development. The centers for higher sense perception were located in different points in the chordate nucleus, and the antenna for these were focused at a point. There were certain foci which were pointed out that had to do with each higher sense development. In most people, the circuits in the chordate nucleus are not connected. This is the best way to describe it. So it's incredible that anyone would appear to have anomalous knowledge about something that they presumably couldn't have heard of before, unless this information was widely known about in 1961, which seems unlikely. We can only guess that Neil herself would have had exactly these connections and used them during her night classes. 
The presentation that Nolan shared with me in January 2019 shows images that match these descriptions from Neil. Innumerable lines like the radiations of the sun. There were very fine lines, thousands of them, and a chordate nucleus is like a miniature brain for higher stages of development. It's worth reiterating that a chordate putamen constitutes only a small area in a central region of the brain. It's also accepted within mainstream science as being the source of higher functions and even described in several papers as processing intuitive information. This detail from Through the Curtain also ties with the work of Helena Blavatsky, where she describes a change in humans where they'd eventually become psychic as they evolve. Many esoteric texts, including Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, appear to agree that humans will evolve this way. These insights appear to match with the work of Green and Nolan and suggest that significant changes may be in the process for the human species. People with these additional connections may need to place themselves into a meditation or trance-like state in order to receive these types of information. I wonder whether using active meditation and imagining environments, therefore allowing the anomalous information to seep into the consciousness via some ultra-low frequency waves and silencing the bodily senses, or even flashes of inspiration via imagery when the brain is otherwise preoccupied with some other task. If any of these assumptions were true, then it would require a complete reassessment of the human condition and our place within or part of the environment. All of which would likely require entire new levels of study in order to even acknowledge a partial understanding of the broader reality. Truthfully, I have no inside knowledge of these systems and processes, and I'm basing this entire video on my own observations, so should only be considered interesting, I hope, speculation. Thoughts on ESP Just as an animal has no understanding of politics or economics, so might we also be incapable of understanding aspects of reality. In fact, there must be elements of the universe that are completely beyond our capacity of comprehending. But how much? If we've misinterpreted reality, then I hope we're able to reassess and make some sense of a deeper truth. So how would something unfamiliar and unseen appear? We'd likely and incorrectly apply the familiar to it. A more correct course of action would be to make lots of small observations about what's seen and heard, as this should remove some bias. Imagine a situation where you're exposed to seeing into another reality. Most people would immediately assume that they're seeing three dimensions and say that they're seeing sky or water for something that appears blue, either high or low in any imagery. As consciousness appears to be within different dimensions to height, width and depth, exposure to higher dimensions may require describing feelings, mental imagery and influence, as that could just as easily be within the parameters of any higher realities, maybe even unrecognised attributes of this one. Our subjective experiences are always being influenced by images viewed within the usual three dimensions, it should really be considered as influencing and being influenced by them. Just as the moving of an object influences spatial dimensions, it also influences conscious experience, only in a less objectively obvious way, and less recorded objectively from a subjective experience like a diary. Society believes that we can only sense three dimensions, so all measurements are based on those. That may be a self-defined delusion. Accepting that other observable parameters exist, then we may be able to better understand the original source and may even help to explain how ESP-like functions could work. Imagine an ESP-type game where a card is presented to somebody and placed on the table. The guesser cannot visibly see with their eyes the potential value of the card, the data, or rather information, is present within the environment. If we assume that environmental changes affect a type of consciousness dimension, 
just as they would have affected height, width and volume, then you can imagine the parameters of the card being accessible to the reader, as it will have affected their conscious state, just as the rest of the environment will have. Just in a very subtle and difficult to recognise way. I even wonder if taking the other cards away would reduce further noise. All information are therefore available. This could explain anomalous information received from things like the CIA researched remote viewing program. Mental exercises of imagining being within other environments may then be beneficial, as it will teach people how to use thought processes and inner vision rather than strictly using the eyes and outer vision. Why does society exclude subjectivity from reported dimensions? Large areas of science considers it an illusion. I suggest that ignoring it could be a self-inflicted limitation. It's likely that we're too quick to conclude all of our experiences, even our sense of who we are and what we're here for. Maybe our understanding of who we are could be a complete misinterpretation. Humanity has already agreed that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of the brain. But what if we got it the wrong way round? A simple reverse of the accepted answer would fundamentally change how we perceive everything. It's easy to rationalise this too, since ideas or thoughts really do come prior to their physical manifestation. Someone thinks of a smartphone and a smartphone eventually manifests. It makes me wonder if our bodies are a marionette that functions based on outside commands, only with a sleeping puppeteer. Real versus unreal. As we gain a greater understanding of the complexity of a potential wider informational field, then people may start to get a better grip on physical reality and our place within it, even to the point where we may be able to adapt physical space to an initially small extent. Aren't we all really doing that anyway? Just we're assuming limits based on bodily interactions rather than less understood changes. The real and unreal may have blurred lines. Maybe the unreal actually is just as real as the objective world. I wonder if we have a creative energy that's somewhat limited by being stuck in a physical body and not recognised or even discussed. A person that's blind from birth and has the brain stimulated in areas of vision may start to develop a synesthesia type response in order to try and interpret that information in a non-visual way. It's easy to imagine that a standard brain, when subjected to non-traditional stimulus, may make interpretations of that information. So they may visualise non-visual concepts in a synesthesia-like way. We could be being subjected to information that we don't recognise, because it's outside of the textbook descriptions of reality. Therefore we struggle to recognise it for what it is. A lot of people may even choose to ignore anomalous information, disregarding that which does not easily fit with a quantifiable world. I wonder if this is a failure of the scientific world, too quick to reject conclusions that do not fit with consensus reality. While writing this, I keep thinking of Aristotle's phrase, greater than the sum of its parts and feel this can be applied to the human condition in quite a literal sense when thinking of physicality and our apparent unrecognised psychic potential. Mm -hmm.